Okay, we are going to start uh, talk about go overview of parotid and thyroid surgery. So during high-risk surgical procedure, the neurophysiological monitoring of the facial nerve and vagus nerve is utilized for the protection of patient motor function. So we are focusing on the motor function of these two cranial nerves. Interoperative neuromonitoring is the relatively recent advancement in EMG applied to uh, ENT head and neck surgery. Its purpose is to allow the real-time identification and functional assessment of vulnerable nerves during uh, different type of surgical procedure. The nerves most often monitored in the head and neck are the motor branch of the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, and the superior laryngeal or re uh, recurrent or inferior laryngeal nerve, uh, which is branches, which are the branches of cranial nerve 10, uh, vagus nerve. Morbidity from the trauma to these nerve is significant and obvious, such as unilateral facial paralysis for facial and hoarseness and loss of voice for the uh, vagus nerve. Avoidance of the interoperative nerve injury is of paramount importance in order to reduce the patient morbidity. In addition, both recurrent laryngeal nerve and the facial nerve paralysis are common reasons for litigation following the ENT surgeries. So uh, first of all, uh, we'll talk about the anatomy of the parotid gland. So in order to do any type of monitoring, we have to start with the anatomy of the structure and then pathology and the function and then the neuromonitoring technique. <clears throat> so parotid gland is the largest salivary gland in the human body. The weight of the parotid gland is about, uh, uh, gland is about 25 milligram. It is located, um, it's an irregular uh, lobulated mass below the external acoustic meatus above the masseter and between the mandible and the sternocleidomastoid sternocleidomastoid muscle. So this is a lobulated gland and it is outside the ear, next to the ear, and it's above, lie above the masseter muscles between the mandible and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The function of the parotid gland is to secrete saliva via the parotid duct into the oral cavity. So parotid gl glands has a parotid a duct which opens in the mouth and for the salivary secretion. The facial nerve travels through the parotid gland and divide into multiple branches before supplying the muscles of the facial expression. So most tumor of the parotid glands are benign. However, uh, about 80% of the salivary gland tumors are benign in the parotid glands. The surgical incision of the parotid gland, also known as parotidectomy, is often performed as the part of the treatment of this tumor. So parotid gland is a very tough tissue, it's a very thick tissue. If any one of you has experience in uh, doing a dissection or cadaver dissection, you can feel it as compared to the muscle and neural tissue and other cardiac tissue, it's very, very tough. It's very hard, difficult to dissect. Uh, especially leaving the facial nerve intact. So it's uh, it's around all the branches of the facial nerve and uh, you have to pick uh, one piece by piece to remove. You cannot just go and excise without damaging the facial nerve. So the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven is in jeopardy during surgery because the parotid plexus on cranial nerve seven is embedded in the parotid gland. So preser preservation of the facial nerve during parotidectomy is the key focus of the monitoring. So uh, the first thing to remember is a history of the muscle disorders. The second is an aesthetic requirement for the surgery. The number three is the setup of the patient with stimulation and the recording electrode. Number four, the record the baseline before we st start the incision. And number five, document and report the data to the surgeon throughout the surgical procedure. So those are the five steps to follow. The fact that parotid glands may become infected, uh, so the parotid gland may become infected by infectious agent that pass through the bloodstream. Uh, the most common one you can see in clinical use is mumps, which is acute, inf communica acute uh, communicable viral disease that has severe swelling it's a, uh, of the parotid gland um, it's also very painful. 
the parotiditis is the inflammation and swelling of the gland and number three is the cellulite or calculus uh, where parotid duct is blocked by the calcified, uh, calcified deposit calcium deposit so those are the most common uh, infection disease you see in the clinical uh, settings the understanding of the anatomy of facial nerve branches in detail before performing the IUM so you have to prepare yourself by studying the anatomy of all the cranial nerve uh, all the branches of the cranial nerve 7 facial nerve and also the muscles supplied by the, the these branches uh, so the name are confusing but you have to make sure that like temporal branch is not uh, not supplying the temporalis muscle which is supplied by the trigeminal nerve temporalis the temporal branch supplies the uh, frontalis muscle so why it matters because the good understanding of cranial nerve pathway will help you identifying the structure at risk during parotidectomy procedures so it's not only identification in the surgical procedure we have to uh, trace the nerves through the parotid glands and uh, through the uh, tumor also so if you look at this picture you have external auditory meatus uh, the external ear and you have the uh, buccinator muscle and tempo masseter muscle and the parotid gland lies above the uh, masseter muscles between the mandible so in this picture this um, parotid gland is in yellow color which is going above the masseter muscle in brown color and it's a parotid gland which parotid gland which opens inside the mouth above the tongue um, the structure important for reference point is zygomatic arch is the bony structure on your face so zygomatic arch below so the tumor uh, the parotid gland is below the zygomatic arch inferior to zygomatic arch and and above the mandible the posterior part of the gland the border is formed by the sternocleidomastoid muscle the sternocleidomastoid muscle as the name says it start is uh, attached to the sternum on the front uh, clavicle which is cledo and mastoid is the mastoid pro process behind the ear so it has three attachment mastoid process sternum and clavicle so that's why the name is sternocleidomastoid muscle so that's the posterior border the superior border is the uh, zygotomatic arch um, and uh, the anterior border is formed by the buccinator muscle so uh, if you have a surgery the first thing we have, we do is uh, understand the anatomy of the nerve and and when the patient is prepared it's the skin is prepared we what we do is we use a handheld stimulator give it to the surgeon and you can stimulate the nerve on the skin uh, so you have to have use a little bit higher stimulation and map out the branches of the facial nerve which are temporal branch zygomatic branch buccal branch marginal marginal mandibular branch and the cervical branch those are the five branches we map out um, with a marker on the skin so that when the surgeon start the incision so already knows where are the branches and then we stimulate um, uh, during the resection uh, proximal and distal to the nerve so understanding again the facial nerve passing through the parotid gland so you mark the branches on the skin and when you remove the skin so you can follow those markers um, the pathology of the tumor uh, the gland is important a patient has a tumor or it has a mumps or, or parotiditis or it's just an inflammation due to the blocked duct so the surgical procedure a parotidectomy is well standard a standardized surgical procedure is usually performed by the ENT and head and neck surgeon or the oral or maxillo, maxillofacial surgeons for benign and malignant condition of the parotid gland the peripheral nerve uh, branches of the facial nerve are the close contact with the parotid gland they goes actually through the gland uh, one and one of the most important and feared complication of this type of surgery is it represented by the nerve injury during the surgical dissection so that will be manifestation of the facial nerve paralysis this can occur through the either mechanical injury which is sectioning of the nerve 
stretching of the nerve or compression of the nerve it can happen due to thermal injuries or electrical injuries or due to ischemia to the nerve or which leads to the temporary or permanent nerve dysfunction uh, with important functional anesthetic uh, changes so in order to have a post-operative facial nerve paralysis you don't have to cut the nerve uh, even stretching of the nerve ischemia to the nerve prolonged irritation of the nerve can cause post-operative facial nerve uh, weakness and paralysis so the recording electrode should be placed in all the branches of the facial nerve so um, all five branches to make sure we are monitoring all the muscles So facial nerve stimulation protein tumor. So um, the surgeon can use a handheld monopolar or bipolar stimulation. Uh, the monopolar st stimulator is ideal for localization of the nerve. And if the nerve is localized, uh, you can switch to the bipolar consenting stimulation for tracking the nerve. Or sometimes monopolar a fine tip is is enough. Uh, but you can. Uh, but if you have a lot of uh, stimulation current spread then you can use the concentrated equipment. We can also put a uh, clip electrode more proximally to the um, uh, origin of the facial nerve trunk and you can do continuous trigger EMG is, uh, uh, in addition to the handheld stimulation. So if you're doing continuous trigger EMG through the facial trunk, that will give you a non-stop uh, continuous monitoring of the facial nerve. Uh, we can also do cranial MEP. Um, so if there's a risk of damaging more proximal to the surgical side for any reason, you can also include the facial nerve EMG, cranial EMG, to monitor the cranial nerve bulbar pathway. So this is one of the patients uh, I did monitoring a long time ago. Uh, it was a 107-year-old patient, and he and that patient has severe necrosis on the uh, on the face due to the parotid tumor you can see the uh, place the electrode uh, for monitoring all the branches um, uh, frontalis for the uh, temporal branch orbiculus oculi for the zygomatic branch uh, nasalis for nasal branch uh, and we have uh, orbiculus oris for buccal branch and mandibular mentalis for the mandibular branch and platysma. So what we did, we took out on the right side. We took out the because the the all the face the face was uh, neck there was a lot of necrosis and damaged tissue. So the plastic surgeon he took out the uh, the whole skin slab until the clavicle and when the tumor was removed, it was pulled back to cover the face. And on the right side, you can see it's a big mass of the parotid uh, gland. So, so this is identification. So the surgeon is stimulating the the gland and trying to find. And you can see the sound will like the some one of the nerve branches is right under that area. So we have, we try to make sure that you are placed very close to the surgical side. You are not behind the surgeon, so you have to make, uh, you are in front of the surgeon, so because you don't need to look at the uh, the head or the feet, but you should be able to look at the uh, the screen. So if, the, if there's a camera in camera, so we should look at the screen, what they're doing. Uh, if you can connect the camera to the computer, that's great. So you can look at, you don't, uh, you can look at the signal and the data at the same time but we should be able to communicate with the surgeon directly face to face. So if you have, you're facing to the surgeon and you give the information because it's a lot of feedback and it's nonstop and the surgeon is depending on the feedback from you. So if you're behind the surgeon, it's very hard to, uh, to communicate. Or if you're next to anesthesia or behind the anesthesia machine, it's very difficult to uh, communicate with surgeon during the surgical procedure. So moving on to the thyroid surgeries. Uh, so thyroid surgeries are, as mentioned earlier, they're also high-risk surgical procedure and one of the very common uh, procedures. So, so, so during thyroid surgical procedure, we do recurrent laryngeal monitoring, RLN, or, or uh, external uh, branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. They are high at risk of 
iatrogenic injury during thyroidectomy given in their close proximity uh, to the thyroid gland and parathyroid glands. Dis despite appropriate surgical training and experience, these nerves may be difficult to identify and protect intraoperatively. Especially in cases of invasive thyroid cancer, large garters, and revision surgery. The interoperative neuromonitoring is a useful aid for localizing and monitoring of these uh, uh, of the electrophysiological status of the recurrent laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal nerve. The current guidelines recommend definite visual identification of recurrent laryngeal nerve or superior laryngeal nerve during thyroid surgery, being this the most reliable method of reducing the rate of the injury. Herman et al. compared two historical cohorts, over 26,000 patients undergoing thyroidectomy for benign disease from a period when the recurrent laryngeal nerve identification was not performed, which is uh, 1979 to 1990, to more recent times from 1991 to 1998, where the recurrent laryngeal nerve visualization was routine practice. So this is no, without stimulation, just visual identification of the nerve before starting the resection. The rate of permanent uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy was significantly lower in the, uh, the second group with the identification, 0.4% versus non-identification was 1.1%. The IOM has been shown to reduce the rate of recurrent laryngeal injury during the revision surgery or when the nerve anatomy is complex, uh, especially the large goiters. Therefore, in the context of high-risk thyroidectomy, IOM is widely accepted to be very beneficial. So just like facial nerve, uh, for, for vagus nerve, uh, understanding the anatomy of the vagus nerve branches in detail before performing an IUM is a very crucial part for a very good uh, monitoring. So you have to prepare yourself. And why does it matter? Because the good understanding of cranial nerve 10 pathways, vagus nerve pathway will help you identify the structure at risk during the periodectomy procedure. So it seemed like a very simple procedure, but again, um, it's not just going stimulation. So if you have the good understanding of the anatomy of thyroid gland in the reference to larynx uh, and trachea and hyoid bone and thyroid muscles and all these structures, then you can give you a better understanding and have a better feedback to the surgeon. So the thyroid gland is a butterfly shaped organ located in the base of your neck. It relates, releases hormones that control metabolism and regulate vital body function. The location, it is the two inch long in normal conditions and lies in front of the throat below the prominence of thyroid cartilage, which is also known as Adam's apple. The thyroid gland has two lobes that lie on either side of trachea and is usually connected by the strip of thyroid tissue known as isthmus. The function, it regulates the breathing, heart rate, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, body weight, muscle strength, menstrual cycles, body temperature, and cholesterol level. So the fact is that the thyroid gland uses iodine uh, from the diet to make two main hormones known as T3 and T4. T3 is triiodothyronine and T4 is thyroxine or tetraiodothyroxine, also known as uh, so iodine is deficient in hilly areas. So people who live in mountain area or at high altitude, they have higher um, incidence of thyro uh, iodine deficiency and if they have in their diet. So if they have a iodine deficiency in diet, so they have a high risk of thyroid, thyroid tumors. So if that's why the iodine is, uh, supplement uh, salts are present in the market so you have to add iodine to your regular diet to uh, avoid the defic deficiency in your diet so t3 and t4 levels are maintained by two glands in the brain one is hypothalamus and the second one is pituitary gland the hypothalamus produces t uh, thyroid stimulating hormone or tsh uh, it's it also uh, <coughs> produces thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH uh, releasing hormone, TRH, that signals the pituitary to tell the thyroid gland to produce more or less of T3 and T4. 
so th thyroid stimulating hormone is activated by thyroid releasing hormone and it cre either it produces more t3 or t4 uh, either by increasing or decreasing the release of hormone uh, and that's called thyroid stimulating hormone so when t3 t4 levels are low in the blood the pituitary gland releases more thyroid stimulating hormone to tell the thyroid to produce more thyroid gland and if t3 t4 levels are high the pituitary gland releases thyroid stimulating less thyroid stimulating hormone to the thyroid gland to slow production and these hormones so when the pituitary gland is increasing the thyroid stimulating hormone to create more t3 uh, t4 by the thyroid gland and if there is less iodine in diet the thyroid gland will get more and more stimulation and ultimately get bigger and bigger and it ends up in the large goiter it is important that t3 and t4 levels are neither too high nor or not too low because increase or decrease both have uh, different effects the hyperthyroidism which is increase in thyroid gland it causes anxiety irritability or mood, moodiness uh, it also causes nervousness hyperactivity sweating or sensitivity to high temperature hand trembling or shaking hair loss or mr light menstrual period so hyperthyroidism have all these effect uh, on the other hand the hypothyroidism if the patient have low level of t3 t4 it creates low trouble sleeping tiredness and fatigue difficulty in concentration dry skin and hair depression sensitivity to cold temperature frequent and heavy uh, periods and joint and muscle pain so uh, having too much teeth, uh, thyroid gland or having too less thyroid gland they both have side effect so that's why it's critical for the body to create a balance and have um, ideal levels in the body in the blood so so types of thyroid cancer according to the national cancer institute there are about 56000 new cases of thyroid cancer in us each year and females are more likely to have thyroid cancer and the ratio is 3 to 1 uh, female to male is 3 to 1 the thyroid cancer can occur in any age group although they are most common after age 30 and its uh, aggressiveness increasing significantly in the older patient so the 85 percent patient have papillary or mixed papillary follicular thyroid cancer which is uh, b9 10 percent patient have follicular or herthal cell thyroid cancer three percent have medullary thyroid cancer and one less than one person have anaplastic thyroid cancer so those are the four categories of the different type of cancers in the patient so that was the anatomy um, and also leading to the uh, further the trail of the of the nerve the biggest means wandering so it's a wandering nerve it's the longest nerve in the body it starts in the brain stem it exits to the jugular foramen uh, in the brain so uh, so the jugular foramen have cranial nerve 9 glossopharyngeal cranial nerve 10 vagus nerve and cranial nerve 11 spinal accessory uh, along with the jugular vein they all exit to the jugular foramen and enters into the neck um, the vagus nerve travel in the neck chest abdomen and pelvis and reach all the way down to the pelvis so the uh, vocal anatomy so the function uh, the voice production is divided into three major categories so you need to have a power source the power source is so the three major categories of the voice production of person number one is power source which is uh, which is the power source of the breath that supports your sound this is the driving force and anything that affect your breath uh, or your lungs can completely eliminate your ability to produce sound number second is the vibratory source the vibration of your true vocal cords uh, vocal fold causes vibration in the air that your lungs have just generated and your abdominal muscle have pushed the complex anatomy of the vocal fold is designed to produce smooth even vibrations which will sound pleasant and not hoarse number three is the resonators resonators give all the richness and tone that make the voice musical and give it individual quality and the character so in order to produce a voice you need to have a power source you need to have a vibratory source and you need to have a resonator any one of these functions will affect will affect 
the loss of voice at a different level. So thyroidectomy is defined as a surgical procedure performed to partially or completely remove the thyroid gland. This term may include total thyroidectomy or partial thyroidectomy, which includes subtotal thyroidectomy and hemithyroidectomy. So either you can have total thyroidectomy, remove left both lobes, you can have um, partial thyroidectomy, taking the part of the thyroid gland, you can have subtotal thyroidectomy, parts of, again, or hemithyroidectomy, you move resection of only one part. Uh, it also associated by parathyroid gland, they are very small, but the parathyroid glands bilaterally and the tumor that may involve removing of those tumors. So thyroid surgeries um, can unfortunately can result in vocal cord paralysis. The com most common com complications are voice change. It can result in aspiration, um, which can result in pneumonia and poor outcome. It can result in airway obstruction. It can also result in tracheostomy dependence of the patient. So in this picture on the right left side, you can see the picture on the left is a unilateral uh, vocal fold paralysis, one side. And on the right side, only one vocal fold is moving. So when you try to talk, there's a large gap between the vocal fold resulting in a weak, very breathing voice. The recurrent laryngeal nerve provides motor innervation to all the intrinsic laryngeal muscles, except the cricothyroid muscles. And the interoperative mounting of the recurrent laryngeal nerve during thyroid surgery is possible when the use of endotracheal tube with two electrodes embedded on its sides. So the, we have the electrode with the bipolar on each side, or you can have a monopolar each side. Uh, the recording elect sorry the recording electrodes are positioned at the level of the vocal cord so the recording electrode are positioned at the level of vocal cords the goal of the recurrent laryngeal monitoring includes identifying identifying the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, predicting the post operative function and avoiding bilateral vocal cord paralysis so you see in this uh, picture, so the recurrent laryngeal nerve comes all the way. It makes a loop under the uh, right uh, subclavian artery. And on the left side, it makes a loop under the arch of the aorta. So the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is longer than the right one. And left side is, that's why left side is always have higher risk of damaging than the right side because of the longer length, it has more risk of having stretch. So spontaneous EMG and trigger EMG from clinical nerve 10 can be monitored from the cricothyroid muscle, which is supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve or a vocal cord muscle, which is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So those are the two branches we have to monitor, we should monitor, because if you're monitoring just the recurrent laryngeal nerve, a damage to the superior laryngeal nerve can also have a post-operative uh, bad outcome and and it will look like a false false negative. But it's not false, false not negative because you're not monitoring the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, so for the vocal cord, we put the electrode on the vocal cord muscles. For the superior laryngeal nerve, we put in cricothyroid muscle, which is between the crack, uh, crack, uh, uh bone and thyroid bone. And in order to place the electrode, you have to give the electrode and sterile electrode to the surgeon and he has to put the electrode or she has to put the electrode uh, after elevating the thyroid muscle. You cannot reach this muscle through the skin. So uh, yeah, when the surgeon starts dissecting, so he removes the thyroid gland a little bit, elevates and put the electrode on one side and then you do testing and then take out the electrode and put it the other side. So you do a one side recording at one time. So in order to reach out to the uh, these muscles, for the superior laryngeal nerve, you, you need to give a very small, less than 10, uh, six millimeter short needles to the surgeon. Uh, for the under, for the sub, sub, uh, inferior uh, recurrent laryngeal, you have to put the elect, uh, use the endotracheal tube. And there are two types of endotracheal tubes. One is a tube with um, embedded bipolar 
electrode. So you have two electrodes on each side, left is blue and the right side is red. And you have to make sure um, they are placed correctly and the electrode is above the bulb and that bulb, uh, that area should, uh, above the bulb should be in touch with, uh, in contact with the uh, vocal cords. The second one is a sticker, it's a butterfly sticker. It comes in um, two sizes, adult, adult and pediatrics. And you have to put that sticker above the bulb the, um, as it comes with instructions. So you can put the sticker and then wrap the, the, the cable. Cable is also sticky. So you wrap this table and make sure it's very, very nicely and clearly attached to that because if there's a bulge, that can cause damage to the vocal cord. And that's connected to a, a reusable cable and you can plug that to the. But this is a monopolar, uh, just a two contact. So the sensitivity is very high, but specificity is very low. You can, it's not possible to differentiate the left and right side. The endotracheal tube, they come in three sizes, the, uh, size six, size seven, and size eight. Those are the inside diameter. Uh, of the endotracheal tube and if you have pediatric patient and then it's very not possible so you have to use the sticky electrode in the, the so when you're looking at the normal thyroid gland you think okay it's very easy to do that but if you have a patient like this so just the picture of the patient you can see how big is the thyroid uh, this is goiter huge thyroid gland and identify on the right side you have a scan uh, image of the of this patient so there's no, it's impossible to find the recurrent angel or superior angel in this patient. So the neuro monitoring, and even you stimulate the skin, you're not going to get anything. So you have to um, be very, very careful and recording MEP or recording, uh, placing a, a continuous trigger MG will be very, very crucial for these type of surgery. So this is one of the patients. Um, you can see the um, skin are draped, so you can see the bulge on the neck. Uh, on the left side and the middle also, and uh, the surgeon has marked this, the skin for incision. And you can see a big goiter there. And here the surgeon is removing this, and it's trying to show the uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. He's dissecting the recurrent laryngeal nerve here. And he's holding the thyroid gland, one of the lobe. So here the surgeon, he took out the thyroid gland. It's uh, not fully detached yet. And he has this probe on the on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Here we did the stimulation. So in order to do an active monitoring, you have to make sure you, if you have a clip electrode, you can stimulate while he's doing resection. Otherwise, if you there's a damage between the two stimulation, you will not be able to identify. So having a, a motor evoke potential and also triggered EMG is uh, very helpful for these type of cases. So another patient have uh, tumor is removed and now the area is empty, so ready to close. He's holding the thyroid gland in the hand. Another patient have incision. Uh, we can see thyroid gland and it's a huge gland and uh, took out again. So this you can see in the middle, you have this arrow, green arrow. This, this is a recurrent laryngeal nerve behind the thyroid tumor. And you can see if I have a tumor on this right side, if you have such a huge tumor, uh, it's very helpful to have an uh, active continuous EMG recording, MEP recording, trigger EMG recording during the surgery. So spontaneous EMG is useless, uh, is not going to help much. And uh, trigger EMG intermittent or at the beginning of the case or the end of the case is not going to be that helpful. So you have to have a continuous trigger EMG and it's very, uh, nice or it's very good if you have a conversation with this and a surgeon beforehand and convince him to use a continuous trigger EMG with a clip on for these cases. So recording of parotid and thyroid gland. So selecting the appropriate modalities for given procedures 
confirming the integrity of both stimulation and recording setup. You have to confirming the stimulator current flow by recording a baseline uh, after exposure. Obtaining a baseline triggered EMG response from the nerve. So that's very, very important. Taking a baseline before you start doing anything. Uh, at, typically, the increasing the stimulus intensity until the response is recorded or reaching maximum stimulation of 1 milliampere. So if you are doing a uh, cranial nerve intracranially, then you have to stop at 1 milliampere if you're direct nerve stimulation. If you're doing uh, indirect to the bone or to the tumor, you can go to 2 milliampere. But if you're in the uh, out on the face or in the neck outside, you can go up to four or five milliampere higher than that. So utilizing continuous of direct nerve stimulation during dissection, again, I'm saying this again and again, when neurostructure are risk, at greater risk, stimulating nerve proximally post resection to confirm the integrity. So you have to make sure once have um, post uh, resection complete, always stimulate proximally and confirm there's no change in threshold or response after the resection. So two things we have to work on is um, active versus passive monitoring. And that terminology is used very uh, in the, at high level in, in monitoring. The active monitoring is referred to uh, as continuous or frequent uh, direct nerve electrical stimulation during a period of tumor dissection when the nerve is at risk. Passive monitoring is referred to a type of monitoring when one reacts only to mechanically evoked response. So you have a train activity or EMG or burst activity and then you stimulate every time or you take the tumor and then you stimulate, that's a passive monitoring. That's not an act active monitoring. Active monitoring, you have a, a, a clip or a Kuba electrode is, or snap-on electrode and you're doing a continuous stimulation during the resection or doing MEP also during this resection. So passive monitoring is unreliable because the mechanical trauma will not result in abnormal EMG activity in all the nerves. Quiet EMG leads to false sense that nerve is unharmed. The active monitoring may continue, um, um, <clears throat> active monitoring by continuous nerve stimulation alert the surgeon about the nerve location and the integrity of the nerve throughout the surgical procedure. So when you're doing that, so the checklist you should have is, Prove the system is working before the incision. Check the stimulation and, and the recording parameters. Check the recording electrode impedance and tap test. So you can tap on the skin, tap on the neck and see if you're getting response. Artifact from the left side or right side, tap on the face uh, or different branches and see all the branches you're getting like artifact. Uh, confirm the current flow by return current. So when you're stimulating direct current on the skin, the, you have a return current coming. Also get a baseline response before the resection and also find the stimulation proximal to resection at very low intensity. So that's a checklist you should keep on the desktop. So programming uh, the gain or sensitivity can be set. That this is the screen sensitivity that can be between 50 to 200 microvolt per division. You have 10 divisions vertically and 10 horizontally. Uh, the gain, uh, of the amplifier or input gain, which is also, which is actually known as dynamic range, should be between uh, 500 to 2000 microvolt per division. Uh, the low cut should be 10 Hertz, high cut should be 5000 minimum. You can go to 10,000, but minimum is 5000. The spontaneous CMG should be about 300 millisecond per division. If you have 300 millisecond per division, you have 3000 millisecond through the screen, which is three second. So if you're less than three second window, you're not going to get a, see a response if it is a very brief firing. Uh, for trigger EMG, one millisecond per division or 1.5 millisecond maximum is recommended. Uh, that's 10 to 15 millisecond window because you're not simulating at CPA, you're simulating very close to the nerve. So response will be very, very short. The stim duration can be between 50 microvolt to 200 microsecond, sorry, 250 microsecond pulse width to maximum of 200 microsecond. Uh, but ideally, 100 microsecond is ideal. Uh, if you have too much artifact, you can go to 50 microvolt, and if you're not getting a good response, you can go up to 200 microsecond. The stim intensity, again, starting from 0 0.05 milliampere to maximum of 4 milliampere. And the stim rate can, uh, you can range from 2.66, 2.79 to 3.79 to 4.79.
and the notch filter should be off in all the cases because you have triggering MG response and notch filter will cause a stimulation artifact. So, um, the, so I'm just giving you example of the programming uh, on the Surgical Studio. It's the same setup you can use on any other program on Cadwell, uh, Metronic, uh, Excel Tech, any other machine. But uh, for the parotid gland, you should have frontalis muscle, orbiculus oculi, orbiculus oris, active reference, mentalis, and platysma muscle. So those are the f five muscles you should have. And you have left or right hand muscles, abductor pollicis brevis, for median nerve train of four, uh, just to make sure patient is not paralyzed. Um, on the right side, so we have the montage. So on the left side, we have the input channel, and the right side, we have the montages, so the active reference. So all the five branches, with a gain of minimum of 500 microvolt per division, which is equal to 5000 microvolt. So if you gain, which is actually dynamic range, input gain, or dynamic range. So if you have 500 microvolt, that means 5000 microvolt. Any signal more than 5000 microvolt will be clipped. And uh, because we want to stimulate very, very low, so this should be uh, enough and should not be clipping the signal. The high cut again at 5000 micro, uh, 5000 hertz, and low cut should be one 10 hertz with notch filter turn off. So in the mode mode setting, you can have spontaneous EMG, trigger EMG, left hand and right hand. So that's the maximum you need. For the trigger EMG, again, you have all the five muscles. Frontalis muscle for the temporal branch, orbiculus oculi for the zygomatic branch, orbiculus oris for buccal branch, or or you can use uh, nasalis also. Mentalis muscle for the marginal mandibular branch, and platus muscle for the cervical branch. Uh, the threshold starting 100 is okay. If you're not getting a response, you can drop down for trigger EMG to 25, if response are very, very small, you can go to 25, 50 microvolt for the threshold, anything above that will be captured, uh, otherwise it will not be captured. The tone, you can either select one tone for all the muscles, or you can have a different tones, and uh, so you can identify which nerve is firing. The sweep is 1.5 millisecond. Uh, you can have ESU, reject and mute on, so that will help you, it will reject, um, any bovi artifact so you, you're not going to get a sudden large noise uh, the auto store either you can have on valid stimulation or you can have on on capture so you want to store all the stimulation you can uh, select the wild stimulation uh, valid stimulation because the valid stimulation will capture everything uh, you can switch change to the on threshold, so if but that anything below that threshold, even few microvolt will not be captured. Stimulation again, uh, we are EX9 low one, so if anything less than four milliampere or ten milliampere should be at low one. Uh, it should it's set to constant current mode, single single tr train uh, with one pulse, uh, two point seven nine hertz, two hundred microsecond pulse width, and maximum st intensity should be four or five milliampere. For thyroid case surgeries, so you need to have left and right recurrent, left recurrent laryngeal nerve, right recurrent laryngeal nerve, left superior laryngeal nerve, and the right superior laryngeal nerve. Uh, and then you have left hand and right hand for train of four. On on the amplifier setup, so you have the same four muscle, <clears throat> but we keep it the, uh, on all the protocol, we keep the superior laryngeal turn off because uh, all that you cannot monitor all superior laryngeal nerve in all the cases. Surgeon may not agree on all the cases, but you can go and enable into the mode setting, not from here. Uh, gain again 200 to 500 microvolts, uh, high cut 5000 and 10 hertz uh, low cut. So you can, so you can have superior laryngeal. All the tests they have superior and left and right superior laryngeal nerve, but you can enable from here just checkbox. Uh, and keep the threshold low so it records everything. One thing you have to make sure you, the reject high impedance trial is turned off. It's not checked because if this box is checked, and if you are recording for four EMG and, and, and one of them is high impedance, 
is not going to stimulate at all you are not it's going to stimulate but you're not going to see any captured data on the screen so if you have a one channel off uh, uncheck <laughs> uh, from here uh, it's going to look at the high impedance so if you uncheck the box into the window it's going to show high impedance not going to work if you uncheck the box from here enable or disable then then it's going to work but in order to avoid all the confusion so just make sure this box and reject high impedance trials should always be turned off constant current simulation low one so for montages again we already talked about the montages to create the montages but in summary for parotid glands in you should have for parotid glands it's not a facial nerve recording from cpa tumor where two branches should, is enough uh, because we are doing the parotid uh, all the branches traveling to and we don't want to paralyze any single branch so we monitor all the five branches and they are present in all the tests uh, for temporal branch zygomatic branch buccal branch mandibular branch and surgical branch for thyroid monitoring should offer always offer superior laryngeal nerve and recurrent laryngeal nerve in all the surgical cases so the superior laryngeal nerve is the cricothyroid muscles and the recurrent laryngeal nerve is vocal cord so I'm sorry, in this slide they are switched. So this is a typo. The superior laryngeal nerve is cricothyroid muscle and the recurrent laryngeal is the vocal cord muscle. The morphology of the waveform. So it's a triggered EMG signal. So we are not uh, worried about the multiple factors of the other evoked responses. So all you have the latency and the peak and trough. So the amplitude of the signal and the latency of the fifth signal. And this is uh, again very simple because we are doing only EMG recording. So we are worried about the muscle relaxation. We have to make sure there's no muscle relaxation post induction and train of force stay four by four. If your train of four is four by four, that means you have less than 5% muscle paralysis. If you have train of four three by four, then you have 65, 75% muscle paralysis, which is not enough to monitor these cranial nerves. So you need to have four by four. And in order to be, have a correct documentation and protect the legal for legal issues and all those issues you make sure you have your train of four uh, and because um, this is cranial nerves so having from hand is is good enough because uh, for spine cases any spine cases you have to do train of four from foot muscles but for cranial if you're not monitoring any motors or emg from the lower extremity then you can, you can do train of four from the hand medial nerve so stimulation sites for um, the goals of stimulation there are four goals always for cranial nerve stim ma mapping one is to identify the nerve the first goal is always to identify the nerve the second is to trace the nerve inside the tumor or in the surgical feed number three is to protect the nerve during the surgical procedure so that's why we do active uh, active monitoring and number four is to check the integrity of the nerve that means when the resection is done at the end of surgery we stimulate and make sure uh, uh, the integrity is still intact so those are the key four goals for monitoring in any cranial nerve emg for stimulation the peripheral nerve is usually stimulated transcutaneously using electrode placed on the skin over the selective nerve uh, uh, and that is for direct nerve stimulation, not for direct nerve stimulation. So if you are doing a, a facial nerve through under behind the ear or a third nerve, then you put on the on the peripheral nerve on the transcutaneously. Uh, but intraoperatively, we do direct nerve stimulation um, to minimize the discomfort. The for the surface, the contact should be less than five kilo ohms, and for direct, it could be less than two kilo ohms. The ground electrode should be placed very close uh, to reduce stimulation artifact on the same side. The pulse should be monophasic, rectangular pulse. Uh, you can do constant current or constant voltage stimulation. Um, typically, we use constant current stimulation. The typical stimulus parameter includes pulse rate of 50 to 100 microsecond or 100 to 200 microsecond with the rep rate between 3 to 5 hertz. The stimulus intensity should be started from 0.05 and increased to maximum of 4 milliampere, but should be kept at the threshold. So for stimulation, um, you can get current shunting 
um, or you can get current jumps. What's the difference between current shunting and current jump? Um, the current shunting is you're stimulating the nerve uh, with a stimulator uh, and the current is uh, going through the uh, the fluid and is so the CSF or the fluid it's <coughs> is uh, shunting all the current back to the uh, return so it doesn't activate the nerve directly so that's you're not going to see any if you have fluid blood or csf in the uh, uh, in the area you the current will go to through the fluid and it's not going to go to the nerve and you have no changes in the signal the current jump on the side is you're stimulating with a monopole stimulator one branch of the nerve but but the current is spreading and it's activating the uh, a nerve very close to by nearby and you get a response and you get a false information for this example like you um, you are active we are stimulating the acoustic nerve or cranial number eight which should not give any emg response but if you're getting a response from facial nerve that the surgeon and we you will think that it's a facial nerve but actually it is because of the current jump to the next cranial nerve so the current jump can be avoided by using the bipolar stimulator either you can use the constant uh, uh, you can use the flush tip concentric bipolar or you can use a very fine tip uh, next adjacent bipolar and if you don't and then you'll see a, a true negative response by stimulating a non uh, motor nerve so stimulator, we have monopolar stimulator, we have bipolar concentric stimulator, or we have bipolar side-by-side -side stimulator. And for continuous stimulator, we have this clip electrodes, and you can put on on the nerve, there's a QI electrode, C-shaped electrode, and this skip clip electrode, these two electrode can be placed on the nerve and you can stimulate directly. Bipolar concentric electrode is a tricky one because it has a cathode in the middle and anode on the circle, but the surgeon has to press hard on the nerve so the the cathode is pushed inside and make uh, 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 to get a response if, if the if you are touching very lightly the cathode is going to touch the nerve but the anode is not going to touch the nerve and you're not the circuit will not be complete so you have to make sure about that so some just a few samples of the recording data from these cranial nerves So triggered EMG. So on this one, this is from one of the cases. So on the left side, you can see it's spontaneous EMG. On, on the right side, you have triggered EMG. Uh, we are stimulating and recording recording from Fendelis, Oculi, Nazelis, Oris, Mentalis, and Platysma. We have six EMG recording and getting response from Oris and Mentalis branches only. So another same thing, uh, trigger EMG responses, facial nerve from orbicus oculi, but not from oris and mentalis. Trigger EMG, so this is parotid glands uh, and getting branch only from oris nerve and not from the other nerve. And that's tell us, okay, this we are very close to the nerve. Uh, one, one of the branches, not all the branches. So this is just a machine with the EMG recording. So you can set up the threshold. Uh, this is stimulator is set to two, two milliampere. Getting response from the two milliampere, which is a little bit higher. So for continuous wiggle nerve stimulation, we can use this clip electrode and you can do ipsilateral recording. Uh, you can have uh, Vocalis muscle on the left side and right side, they will have a different morphology. The contralateral side, there will be maybe some current spread, but morphology very small and maybe have an inverted peak. 
Um, this is the again as you can have stack of trigger EMG. You can always look at stack, so you can look at what what was the threshold or the response on the previous traces. You can spontaneous EMG. So spontaneous EMG, trigger EMG, and stack window. So I use all three windows also all the cases. So just <clears throat> so <clears throat> we have uh, nothing is missed. Another patient. This is a facial. This is for the uh, facial nerve monitoring. Another patient with spontaneous EMG have uh, analysis window at the bottom. Recurrent laryngeal nerve trigger EMG. This is a monopolar recording from the sticker, so that's why you're stimulating one side, but you're getting response from both sides. But the the, the phase reversal, so yeah, we know that the response is actually a far response from the same nerve. So this is normal vocal cord. So if you ask the patient, mm -hmm. this is a clinic. So, so left and right. So you can see the both vocal cord of working patient can have have a different type of voices and you can see the trachea. But if the patient has a unilateral vocal cord, the one side will not move. Um, this is a good example of this patient. So this patient has a vocal cord plus on one, on one side, the, so one side is moving, but the other side is not moving. So it has total, um, you can see the very clearly the difference between the So this patient has a bilateral vocal cord and both vocal cords are not moving. So uh, for, the, for the summary, the takeaway is to understand the anatomy of physiology uh, more in detail, more you know right now, um, try to understand the anatomy and physiology in more further detail, the anatomy of not only the nerve, the structure around the nerve, the structure anterior to the nerve, structure posterior to the nerve, so the medial to the nerve, lateral to the nerve, what are the boundaries of the glands, uh, the thyroid gland, what is the inferior boundary, posterior, medial, and superior boundary, what is the boundary of the parotid gland or facial gland, uh, what are the blood supply, uh, what is the venous drainage, uh, memorize the recording and stimulation parameters. So those recording and stimulation parameters, the filters, the uh, high cut, low cut, stimulation rate, pulse width, they should all be memorized. So they are very simple stuff. It's the same EMG, same uh, trigger EMG parameters. Um, the threshold for simulation is lower for cranial nerves, but I'll try to make sure you have memorized that and you remember that. So the troubleshooting, the monitoring is much more interesting more. So you don't have to go and find uh, from the notes or paper. So understand the surgery, what's being done, uh, what's the surgeon is going to do, what's the next step, what can complication, so that every patient will be different, the tumor will be so big, so beautiful, and that's the, and the reason for doing the surgery will be different for different patients to discipline. Okay, thank you.